Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. And we have Mike with us today. But before we kick off, Mike, are you prepared to engage? You know it. <laughs> Let's do this because we have today with us Mike Montague. Is that, is that right? I'm Montague. Montague. We have Mike Montague, who is a game show host, a public speaker, a podcaster, and a radio. He has been a radio DJ, a karaoke host, virtual game host, MC, and DJ for live events, including an opening for Billy Idol, Frankie Valley, and MC'd at Toby Keith's Bar and Grill. And he is also the founder of Playful Humans, which is a community designed to help burned out and bored get re-energized and engaged with life. And his mission is to help adults rediscover the power of play and avoid a midlife crisis. And we'll probably be talking through quite a few of these things throughout the episode. But Mike, is there anything that we're missing that you want to make sure we put in right now? Oh, I think you nailed it. But since this podcast is specifically about gamification, I have designed sales training programs for the last six years, and I have built some online courses and things too. We can jump into that if you want, but really my passion is about the live gaming and the game shows and engaging <laughs> people uh, face-to-face these days since it's so rare. Sounds absolutely great. Absolutely great. So yes, we will be getting into that definitely. And the first thing we want to know is what does being Mike, what are you doing these days? What does it look like to be Mike in a day like today, yesterday, last week, whatever you want to go for? Sure. It's been a a busy week, but usually my days kind of include three or four different things. So I love to speak and write. I'm most engaged in my life when I am creating something. So like this podcast is a great example of me getting to play, have fun, be in flow. And so I usually have a podcast recording every day. I happen to host two weekly shows. So that's at least twice a week I have those, but I also appear on others. The Playful Humans podcast, I interview people who play for a living, like jugglers, comedians, mentalists, actors, all kinds of cool things. The guy who founded Comedy Central in the United States or... uh, Justin Guarini from American Idol and Broadway fame here in the U.S. And then a sales podcast for Sandler Training called How to Succeed. That one's very popular. It has over 2 million downloads, and I interview sales and leadership experts. And I've been doing that show for five years. So that's been going a long time. There's over 500 episodes, and you can dig into that one for quite a while. Usually some sort of podcast recording happens in my day. I also do sales training where I teach classes for large enterprise level organizations. Sandler trains thousands of people all around the world from individuals with local locations and offices to big international companies. And I work on the national team. So that means I work with companies like Uber or Thermo Fisher Scientific or large companies like that, Salesforce, LinkedIn, HubSpot, where I'll do some sort of virtual training in a day. And I love doing that, interacting with people running workshops and engaging with people in interesting discussions, Uh, helping them solve problems is always fun for me. (laughs) I also work on the marketing team for content creation. So usually that involves writing a blog or two a day or some sort of online course or collaborating and having people interview me as a subject matter expert for could be white papers, articles, press releases, things like that. And I finished with the game shows. So for fun, at night I host (laughs) game shows, either online or in person here in in Kansas City, Missouri. I also travel and do team building workshops and things where I I run famous TV game shows or game shows that I made up and, and games that we create, depending on what the audience and situation calls for. But, you know, doing employee engagement, happy hour stuff and having fun with people. And that's where I really just relax and and play games and have fun and spend the rest of the time relaxing with my wife, enjoying good food and and beverages. (laughs) Sounds absolutely great. 
So Mike, after hearing, you know, you're involved in so many things, I want to clarify on this one. You know, we're looking for a story, but not just any story, not just the story of whatever. We want a story where you were, you know, going somewhere, you know, where you're you're aiming north and you ended up south. You know, things did not go your way, especially if it involves some sort of, again, as you were saying, game show some sort of gamification, playfulness, something along those lines, because we want to be there with you and we want to learn some lessons from that story. Oh, I got one for you. This is my favorite question. I actually asked this on one of my podcasts as well. My favorite failure of all time was getting fired by Billy Idol live on stage (laughs) in front of thousands of people. So not even in the back room. I was on stage playing music as a DJ as his opening act and like, the the lights went off. My sound didn't work. They put on house music. I look over to the side of the stage and the, the manager's doing the like cutthroat sign. And he's like, you're done. I was like, wow, that hurts. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll give you the one. full story. But I got to say up front, it's my favorite story to tell because after that, I have been bulletproof as a performer, right? If, if something messes up, our internet goes out or something on this podcast, it's not the worst thing that's ever happened. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> After that experience, I'm invincible. I can go do whatever I, I want to do and have fun with it. And all the stage fright is gone away. It's really not going to be worse than that. So can, can you go a little bit deeper into that? Like what happened? Why were you fired? And of course, if you would do something differently now with this experience on your back, like what would that be? Like we, we want to go through that sort of experience with you. Yeah, it was really interesting because it all happened so fast. His opening act got sick, and this was a a long time ago. It was in like uh, 2007, I think. And I was a club DJ, very popular in in Kansas City and on the Top 40 radio station and the retro radio station at the time. So I was on the retros doing kind of an 80s weekend type DJ thing, so they asked me to come play music for an hour and kill time for people coming into the concert because, you know, it said it started at seven, but it wasn't going to start until eight since the opening act wasn't up there. So I said, sure. And I met with Billy Idol and his manager before the show. And they said, play, you know, a lot of retro music, play mostly rock and you know, whatever I play on the radio was fine. But they said it's a rock show and don't play any Billy Idol songs because they were going to play those later. Right. And hmm. I thought. Sure enough, easy enough. I rock this audience all the time. I love retro music. I grew up in the 80s, had fun. And this is like my crowd. This is a soccer mom crowd (laughs) of like, you know, (laughs) younger to to middle-aged women in a Billy Idol audience, you know, in the 2000s. So I'm thinking, this is my sweet spot. I got it. I go out there and I'm playing what I would equate with Billy Idol, like, 80s rock, Aerosmith, uh, Jenny, 8675309, Rick Springfield's Jesse's Girl, you know, something like that. And the manager comes out and he said, we said it's a rock show, play rock music like the Rolling Stones. And I thought, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't really see Billy Idol as classic rock, but I can do that, you know, it's having fun. And then I look down, this is the time before Wi-Fi and immediate downloads, I'm looking at my CDs and I'm a club DJ. There's like two rock songs that you can dance to. It's you shook me all night long and pour some sugar on me. (laughs) And so I play those and now I'm eight minutes into this hour long set. And I realized that it's running pretty low. So I find a Rolling Stone song. I forget which one it was now. And then uh, I find maybe one other song too, like, uh, Leonard Skinner or or something like that. And I'm about 15 minutes in. I go, okay, well, I've played four rock songs in a row. I can change it up now. And so I always like to throw in jokes and lines to get people dancing. So I played Casey and the Sunshine Band, do a little dance, make a little love and get down tonight. But I said, not necessarily in that order. Save the making love for the end of the night. You can (laughs) do a little dance and get down though. And I play the song and then that's when I just get fired. And... uh, (laughs) Did not collect $200, did not pass go, just packed up my stuff and slinked off the stage and (laughs) went out the back door. (laughs) And I did stay, I think, and watch part of the show with other people from the radio station that were there. But it was pretty brutal explaining why I was done about 25 minutes into an hour long set. And I, I think the lessons learned from that are really about 
understanding who your real audience is, who's paying you, especially if you're doing gamification for a living, we think the audience is the only thing that matters, right? The ladies in the audience were loving what I was playing, but that's not who was paying the bill. That was not the goal of the show, (laughs) right? I was hired by Billy Idol, not by the audience. And so I think that's a really good lesson for gamification. Even if you come up with something that people think is fun, the audience enjoys, if it's not solving the problems for the people that hire you, it's not an effective solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. So make sure you get your objectives right, so to speak. And, and if you get what your you're objectives being measured right, on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. You make sure of that. Of course, you do consider your audience because it is fundamental. It is crucial. I mean, if they don't, if, if you had the audience completely dead, that would not have been a success either, for sure. But it was not the only thing you had to take care of. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that story and getting into that painful <laughs> uh, <laughs> stage fright kind of moment, I would guess. So so thank you for, for that story. I think there is a big lesson right there, as, as you were saying. And going sort of 180 degree spin, like going for the opposite thing, you, you went head first, you went to, uh, in, through a big challenge, something you wanted to solve, to, to manage, to, to get to some objective you wanted to reach, and you actually did. And, and we want to be there again with you, see what were maybe some of the keys to that success. How, how did you manage to, to do that? And, you know, hear that story for sure. Yeah, this is a, a tougher one for me. I think sometimes when you succeed, it feels easy, right? So you don't see those <laughs> things as big monumental moments as you should have. So I'll throw out a couple and then I have a story for you. So I did get to open for Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons and I had an even bigger crowd. It was about twice as big as the Billy Idol one and I crushed it. I did well later. And so I felt like I checked that off the list. I've mentioned earlier that the How to Succeed podcast has been become successful. That was really a cool thing for me. I think when it started crossing like 50,000 downloads a month, I was like, wow, that's a lot of people. (laughs) That's a big, big milestone for me there. But, and the other little ones too, you know, just creating courses and things that people enjoy and you get a good feedback or a good review from somebody that went through a quiz or, or something and they really enjoyed it and had fun. But the one that comes to mind most for me is around employee engagement, because I think everybody, especially over the last couple of years, has been burnt out. They've been working hard. They're kind of languishing and grinding, and it feels like this thing is never going to end. And so with Playful Humans, I have designed some really cool like happy hour mixers and team building events and finding people really light up, like laughing out loud you know, clapping, cheering, having fun at work to me in this time is really the most rewarding, rewarding, designing something where people are that engaged, paying attention that they're, they're going all out. They're putting their whole hearts into it. Like I said, they're laughing, they're paying attention and, you know, coming off mute so that we can hear them laugh and and sing along (laughs) or or stuff is really fun for me. And, And one of those that I did recently was a happy hour where we designed different comfort zone challenges for people. So we broke up into different teams and we had five different challenges. First one is just creating the most creative team name possible. And you get one to five points for that team in first place gets five points. Team in fifth place gets one point, And I was the, <laughs> the judge. And then we added more and more creative activities. So first one was like make a best sound and then maybe show us a big surprise from under a T-shirt or a towel or throw a piece of paper into a trash can from the furthest distance away. And whoever, you know, did it the furthest gets five points. Whoever does it the closest gets one point. And we just played games with people for an hour and they loved it. They totally forgot about work. They were, were super engaged and present. And hopefully they forgot about the coronavirus and everything else, too, for an hour. And I, I think that's for a while at least. Right. Yeah. That's a really big win these days. Sounds absolutely great. And talking about those things, because you're, you're talking about these these happy hours and these events that you create to engage people at work perhaps to achieve some objectives. I'm guessing that when you're approaching one of these challenges, you have some sort of ideation process, some sort of steps. How do you come about to these these ideas? How do you, if you're tasked with doing something new, how would you go about it? I get that question a lot because I like to change things up, especially when I have repeat clients, like I'm at the same company for a year. It doesn't work just to play like a, a family feud style survey game every single time. <laughs> they're they're going to get bored with that. They can be super fun and people engage with it. 
But after time, you feel like you want something new. You've, you've seen it before. And so I try to bring something new all the time for these ongoing clients that, that I work with. And I make up a lot of games, but I do have a system for that. And I think the first one is finding a game framework that already works. So I like to read books, watch videos, study what other people are doing, and make sure that it's a sustainable framework for the game that I know will work and people will have fun with. Then think about the content and see if I can make it the most relevant or the most engaging questions or or activities or things inside of that framework. And then I try to take another five to 30 minutes to add some sort of magic or spin on it that nobody else has, has thought of before. Like, how can I tie those things <laughs> together? Like the audience, the content and the game framework to make sure that it's going to be a special event for everybody and that it's, it's going to work. And so that magic element for me has been actual magic I've disappeared on stage before. I have uh, time traveled on stage before. I've done different, you know, juggling or mind reading or card tricks on stage before. So I love all of that. But it could also just be something fun, like finding a theme song for it or music is huge for me. I love that. Or a funny joke or taking some time to think about how to tie in personalized content. Like, can I survey the people attending and then use their Facebook photos in the game or something like that. And um, I really love it when that happens too. And people generally get a much bigger kick out of it. If we do like a, uh, a photo contest or a caption contest with funny photos from their Instagram or, or Facebook <laughs> with other employees in the company or the leaders of the company, they will just hoot and howl and, and laugh at that. So it's really fun. Sounds absolutely fantastic. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. Mike, what would you say is, you know, with this experience that you've had creating these game shows, engaging employees all around the world, what would you say is, you know, a good practice, the best practice, something that you would say, well, if you're going to engage in this kind of situations and this kind of ideas, if you take this into consideration, it's at least going to make your project a lot better. What, what would that what would that be if you if you had to point out to one? I would just say more points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots of easy rewards is way more motivating than <laughs> one big hairy grand prize. So I, I think sometimes when people you know, design a game show or they design some sort of gamification in a, a course or something, they're thinking about the certificate or the big prize at the end. What I found is you need to think about those either intrinsic or extrinsic award rewards at the beginning. How do you get lots of easy rewards going so that it builds momentum over the course of it? And also just more points, more badges, and, and more rewards is more fun. You feel like you're making progress. A million points sounds better than 10 points. So, you know, give them away in, in bunches of 1,000 or 10,000 <laughs> is just more interesting than getting one or, or 10 points. And I think that's my top tip is just, you know, have more fun and, and give away a lot more gifts, rewards, and, and prizes. That sounds great, especially if you're thinking of the, the onboarding part of the experience, so to speak, the, the, the initial part to kick it, things off. You're thinking about how, bring, how you bring those people on board and giving them some sort of incentive. Again, there could be physical rewards, extrinsic rewards, intrinsic rewards, whatever that looks like. It could be an interesting one. But, you know, as I always say, there's always a warning when using these things. You can overuse them as well especially over the long run. If you, you have as an event, yeah. you know, that's absolutely fantastic. You can just overuse them as much as you want to. If you're going to do it over the long run, you just, you know, make sure that you give away enough so that people get engaged and then sort of start, I don't know if powering it down, but moderating it so that people get into some sort of steady rhythm and don't, you know, get, I don't want to say addicted, but they, they, they sort of are expecting those rewards all the time. And kind of forget of the actual main activity that is that whatever it is that you're doing to help them have fun and achieve those objectives of your client and of those consumers as well. So fantastic. Very, very, very good 
Two points for that bonus tip, Rob. Uh, I like <laughs> Two million it. points. Come on, come on. Oh, <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> and I was just going to say, like, you can spread those out too. And I kind of like it exponentially where, you know, you get one point for spelling your name correctly and getting started, right? And then you get two <laughs> points quickly after that. But then when you get to, you know, later things, it's happening every 500 points, you're getting a badge or every thousand then. And then you kind of increase those exponentially. Like you said, you make the rewards bigger, but they kind of taper off the longer you go. I I find that very motivating. Makes a lot of sense. And talking about these recommendations is after listening to these, these ideas, these, these questions, does anybody come to your mind? Is it like you would say, Oh, I would really like to listen to this person answering those questions. Like another guest on professor game, for example, have you interviewed Carl Cap before? Yes, once. Absolutely fantastic. He is all in for learning and gamification completely. Yeah, great. I've guess. had him on my podcast as well. The, the person I haven't that I would love to interview too is Jane McGonigal. She writes a, a lot on games and especially video games and game mechanics. And I would love to hear more from her. She is absolutely fantastic. A great speaker, great designer. And she sort of helps move ideas and opinions forward. That, that's, that's very, very good, especially in the areas of game design and games with a purpose and gamification as well. I know I don't know if you, you ever read this, but initially she was very wary of the word gamification itself. She didn't like it. Then I wouldn't say she was on board, but she was sort of okay with that as well. She went to the, even went to the Gamification World Congress at some point or, or the mm-hmm. other one. I'm not sure which one. Yeah, I I think all of her stuff is great. I've read a couple of her books. And one other thing I would suggest, and I I can't remember the name right now, but I've read a book on the history of game shows. But I would love to hear from some of those people that created all of the games we know. It was basically two guys who created every game show, like Password and Family Feud and Price is Right and Wheel of Fortune and all of those game shows. from us growing up and and earlier, were all created by the same production company. And so I would love to hear how they came up with all those different frameworks and how they think about games and video games and stuff nowadays. Wow, sounds absolutely great. And I I was going to say, just before I forget about it, many people have mentioned Jane McGonigal as well. Fun fact, not everybody knows is she has a twin sister <laughs> and she is also a PhD, super smart as well, but she is, she is a, a more into psychology as well, but absolutely fantastic. I heard her on an app I have for meditation when it was like, but this is Jane. It's like, no, 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 it's not Jane. <laughs> it's her twin sister. So fun yeah, one as well. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And again, getting into the recommendation space, is there a book that you would recommend the engagers, an audience like this one who's looking at gamification, how to engage employees, students, whatever that could be? Ooh, uh, good question. I've read a ton of books on this subject. No one book kind of jumps out because I think there is so many different aspects to, to come from this. My personal passion happens to be around happiness and using the the power of play for your own personal engagement and stuff. So I think the book of awesome or the happiness equation by Neil Pasrich, Pasricha. I don't know how to say his, <laughs> his last name, but uh, the book of awesome, uh, 1000 awesome things is his blog is a great place to start just to look for more happiness and, and more fun things in your life. Sounds absolutely great. Absolutely great. Very good books. I haven't read them. (laughs) I have to say that. I'm a bit back in my log, in my backlog of (laughs) reading books, but hopefully I will eventually get to those as well. I got about 10 or 15 in my Amazon wish list myself. (laughs) Mine is is about that long or probably a bit longer. And I have some books that are physically here already waiting for me to read too. (laughs) So there you go. And again, you've been recommending, you know, ideas, people, books for, you know, third parties, so to speak. What would you say is your thing, your, your, your superpower in talking about playfulness in games and gamification? For me, I think it's, I call myself the chief instigator at Playful <laughs> Humans. And I think I like to be a role model and an instigator, but, but also like a host or a producer of fun and playfulness and games for people. So my superpower from hosting karaoke nights to game shows to concerts and uh, even sales training events and sales kickoffs for for companies is really around 
facilitating fun and creating an atmosphere of openness that it's okay to be a little silly, that it's okay to to laugh and try some things and, and joke around and move things along too, right? Part of uh, uh, putting on a good show, I think, is just moving the ball forward and keeping people and momentum going and things. And that that's really my superpower is, is sort of hosting and, and facilitating other people's fun. That sounds uh, like an absolute superpower, super important, super useful as well in your line of work for sure. And now comes a very difficult question. I, I get this feedback from most guests and it has to do with what would you say is your favorite game? Ooh, I got lots <laughs> of favorites, but I have just found a British game show that I love called Taskmaster. And it is absolutely silly, completely pointless. And uh, <laughs> it's it's created by comedians. And they have a Taskmaster who assigns these five comedians different tasks to complete. And so it might be get an egg as high as you can without breaking it. And they turn out to be hilarious, but they're available on YouTube. Just search Taskmaster and watch some of the complete episodes or, or even a couple of the bits that they cut out. Like the egg one, one guy gave up. He was trying to build a, a tower out of like construction paper and it collapsed. And so he just set the egg on the table he ended up getting like second place because three other people broke their egg. And so <laughs> it's just hysterical when the comedians make fun of how these other people creatively solve these challenges and, and problems. Really fun. <laughs> interesting. Sounds very, very interesting for sure. And when we have some time and we do every now and then at the end of an interview, we also like to grab a random question from the audience. So here we have one from Dustin Block. Dustin Block says, I'm starting a user research lab to ask our most engaged users what they need or want. What questions do you ask to get to the heart of the matter, to get to the heart of the matter of understanding what their needs are, what, what they want to get from that? So I'm guessing this one, you were talking before about the difference between the client and the customer or, or, or the consumer, yeah. so to speak. So I'm guessing this one leans a bit more into the consumer, but I, I guess you can speak from both as well. Like, how would you make that question to Billy Idol? Like, what is it that you want from me? <laughs> well, that's a good question because I am not a fan of surveys. So I'll just stay straight out that you might think about a different way to accomplish the same task because I found that people don't know what they want a lot of the times <laughs> and sometimes they're completely wrong. What they think they want is not what they need or not what they they really want. Okay. For example, I, I DJ'd a wedding one time, right? And the bride and groom were like, we're not playing the chicken dance no matter what. We want uh, all this like hard metal rock that me and our, our friends like, and that's all we're going to want you to play. And I was like, that's fine. I can do that. But you're, you know your wedding's going to suck. It is not going to be fun. <laughs> Grandma and your nieces and nephews are going to hate this wedding reception. Like, are you okay with that? And they were like, yes, we are, you know, and... I've had this several times. One time that I, that I was explaining there, everybody left. It was just them and their six friends for four hours by themselves because all of the rest of the family left. Uh, <laughs> Ouch. 20 minutes in. And, I, you know, if they were okay with that, that's great. Other times I've had brides come up to me and go, uh, yeah, you're playing the chicken dance. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Everybody's be beating <laughs> us up about this. Like, uh, let's have some fun and dance. And I'm like, okay, they changed their mind at the last minute. But I've also seen this in online courses and things. Sandler Training has hundreds of thousands of people in their online learning platform. And we survey them from time to time. But people will generally say, we want shorter content. We want it easier. We want it safer. This joke might offend people. Then you get two minutes of watered down you know, junk that doesn't mean anything to anybody and doesn't move the needle or they don't actually learn or change yeah. their behavior. Because... It's the hard part, right? Changing your behavior or, or your beliefs is difficult. So nobody's going to say, I want you to challenge me uh, and make me change my <laughs> mind in a survey, right? So then they're going to play games that are difficult, right? <laughs> Which is... Well, and the same thing too, right? I, I've just found like in podcasting and other games that sometimes you can't predict those results. So games that you think would be boring or wouldn't work like Tetris <laughs> take off and you know, 100 million people play it. And then games that are super designed and involved and have amazing graphics, they're like, eh, it's too complicated. I don't give it. And people give up. So I've found you really have to watch their behavior 
and, and watch what moves the needle and not what people say that they want, but also build what makes you happy and try a lot of things, A, B, test a lot of stuff and have fun with it. And don't worry too much about the, the results and the scores unless they're, uh, like you said, directly the people that matter <laughs> or, <laughs> or you're getting negative feedback, then I think that's a different story. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. So, Mike, is there any final piece of advice you want to leave our engagers with? More prizes, more gifts, <laughs> uh, more invitations, people, free food, always a good motivator. <laughs> people will do a lot of stuff for a T-shirt. So get out there and, and have some fun, make up some great prizes and go do it. Absolutely. Sounds great. Mike, where can we find more about you? Let us know. This is sort of the plug zone, so to speak. Anything else you just want to say? This is the final time before we say it's game over. (laughs) I always hate the end of a game, for sure, and the end of a good conversation. But Playful Humans is at PlayfulHumans.com. Sandler is at Sandler.com. You can find the How to Succeed podcast or Playful Humans podcast uh, wherever you're listening to this. It's on all of the apps. And other than that, you can reach out to me, Mike Montague, MikeMontague.com, and love to help anybody if you have any questions or if you need a host for anything fun, I'm certainly (laughs) willing to play well with others. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining us today, for spreading that wisdom, spreading those wise words of experience that you've had, all those, you know, good and bad experiences. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it is fantastic to have you here. And thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. And I'd like to know, how are you listening to this podcast? If you're doing it through any of the podcasting apps, have you followed? Have you rated this podcast yet? You can do so for free. And that way we can reach more engagers like you to achieve our mission of making learning amazing. And if you want the instructions, all you have to do is go to professorgame.com slash iTunes. And remember, before you go on to your next mission, please go ahead and subscribe or follow whatever that looks like in your podcasting app, your favorite podcasting app, and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.